right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is February 22nd, 2023. And yes, it is my number date. That 222 I've told you guys about over the years. It's been around my life since I was a little kid. I didn't acknowledge it noticingly being around my life till I was in my early 20s and I just thought it was weird. You know, I wasn't really following the Lord. Um, and today is that date and we're still here and nothing ha has happened. Now, it's not that we were looking for 222 uh, outside of the fact that I'm looking at that for the last 20 years because my son is 20 years old today. I can't believe it. Give him that big hug and the, the tears well up. I can't believe my little boy is 20. I can't believe it. And then I looked at him. I said, and it means I'm 50. <laughs> All right. So, yes, uh, you might think, why am I doing a video on a night when it's my son's birthday? Well, we had the uh, dinner on Sunday with family. And, uh, of course, you know, he's got a girlfriend and he's got all his friends. So uh, they're out having fun tonight. So it freed me up for tonight. And we're going to do some more studying. I'm going to show you some more things. We're, we're going to touch on some things that I know everybody's looking to hear uh, in relation to timing and what's happening. But we're also going to talk about some new, uh, not new scripture, but new connections in scripture. As I was contemplating doing a video and saying, you know, doing a video that kind of covers uh, an array, may maybe all or the vast majority of all of these things, all of these typologies revealed within the Gospels. So I was we were going to go through Luke, Mark, Matthew, and go through them and, and show all of these different meanings, all of their connections. Look at how this means that and, and go through a whole list of them. And as I was I was considering that because I thought, well, that's going to actually be a big video. So I don't think I'm going to be uh, able to add that into what I'm going to start with, with the season and times that we're in. But as I started doing it, I got into a piece of Luke as I was looking at some things. And we're going to get some more insight, brothers and sisters. You see, one of the things, I love it how the Lord works, how the Spirit is leading. Because one of the things we know here in this ministry as 14ers is there's a group that is going to be chosen as what we call the remnant bride, that disciple. There is an apostle group, but there is a disciple group as well. And that disciple group, which is known as Smyrna, is going to be here with the Lord for 40 days. They're going to be anointed. They're going to have the understanding of all things. In fact, they're going to have so much understanding, they're going to be as Christ. Okay, They're not going to be equal to Christ. No, no servant is above his master. But you're going to see what I'm talking about. And you're going to see these connections. Like I've got like, I don't know, 12 tabs or so open there. And it's just from one chapter in Luke where I'm going to lay out these connections in that chapter to other things we've shared and, and show that it's a period of time in the typology where the Lord is here in that window of the beginning when he comes as the Son of Man for 40 days. It's awesome. You're going to see it. You're going to see the wording. You're going to see what he calls them, what he tells them, the authority they have. It's pretty wild. And I, I was like, man, I, how come I never saw this before? Well, because it's a chapter I've never really spent too much time in. So it's pretty cool. But before we get there, we're going to spend a little bit of time of this season and time we're in. I think many of you guys have an idea of where I'm going. But I'm not going to have a, <laughs> a direct full answer for you, except the answer is going to be Taurus. All right. And I'm going to explain a little bit um, of what I mean when I say Taurus and and prove that the connection. Sorry, one second. And prove that the connection to the bride of Christ is the first fruits that we know about. OK, Christ was the first of the first fruits and the. Pre-trib, bride of Christ, Christ, weed harvest is the first fruits as well. Okay? There are only two. And when you see where they're observed, you see what the connections are within them. And it will bring us in to two other chapters, one in particular, 
that we haven't spent much time in in the Old Testament. And we're going to make connections between the Leviticus and this piece in Numbers and just see where these things lead in their connections. So, you know, a lot of this, what it's, what it's really showing to us is a couple things. You know, those of you would have probably seen a video I did two days ago. If you got in real quick, you would have seen a video I did. It was like 58 minutes long, and I deleted it uh, yesterday morning when I woke up. And the reason I deleted it was because it was a time-sensitive thing. I was certain, I was positive, like to the best of my ability. I mean, there's never been a thus saith the Lord. But knowing the season and time that we're in, believing we have finally understood the revelation of 70 years that we're in it, it's only where the Lord is counting from, which relates to Taurus. But I did a video with a connection to a number which was 746. And in the Greek, it means beginning in all of the places we know it to mean. Just as Taurus and beginning and all of these things, like the beginning of the 50 days, where it's all going to begin. And when I woke up, obviously the time had come and gone. So I deleted that video. I didn't want it to bring any confusion. I didn't want it to, to, to really sit with people. And, you know, I missed it. It was wrong. And it was really just a focus revealing that specific time on February 21st at 7.46 a.m. Nothing happened. All right. So many of you had asked. I thought I saw a video. You did. <coughs> I deleted it. All right. The time had come and gone. But what you're going to see is as we talk about this in relation to Taurus, I, as I was contemplating this today, you know, we, we've tried to understand when the Lord is telling us Taurus, when the spirit revealed right on target and it revealed to us the bullseye, the eye of Taurus, the Aldebaran eye. This was about a revelation of the 50 days before the 14 years of tribulation begin. Okay. Those 50 days and the 14 years and then the 50th Jubilee that follows, the 50th year, the final Jubilee, when that was confirmed, it was about the understanding that it would be that everything was right on target. So when we understood and we continued for the last two and a half plus years to dig in to the revelation and the understanding and these things within Taurus and, and all of these connections, I mean, as you guys know, even to the connection of the pendant that Christ was wearing on the Shroud of Turin that has the letter Nun Aleph Ayin, which is the number 70. You can't see it here. You guys have seen other pictures, which means 70, 1, and 50, or 1450. This is a, that pendant, and what it says on it was the literal head of Taurus. It was the literal head of Taurus, like Jesus calling himself the beginning and the end. That beginning is Taurus. But as I was contemplating these things today, I started to realize, you know, we, we've been trying to say, well, is, is Taurus the beginning like it's going to be the beginning of the year? Meaning, should we count from Savan Taurus or even include the number of days the moon is off? Right? That That's the kind of stuff we don't quite know for sure yet. But we know it's related to Taurus. So, is the Lord trying to tell us that as it was in the beginning, as this beginning is going to be, because in the beginning, he is the first, he is the last, he is the first fruits. That word in the beginning is, is the word for first fruits, the feast of first fruits. When we go to another piece of scripture and we see where all of the, the feasts of the Lord are laid out through two chapters and numbers, you're going to see that the feast of first fruits isn't even mentioned. Every other one is, even to the day feast, the uh, the day sacrifice, the week, the, the month, then the feasts, and yet the feast of first fruits isn't there. It's really quite interesting, and I think it not being there is going to add a, a, a another layer of things that we're not going to get into tonight. I'll spend some time in them, but adds a whole other layer of things going on as to why it's not mentioned. But you're going to see these connections within first fruits and within all these times so in relation to to taurus i'm not saying that i believe that that nissan isn't nissan with the you know whether it's adjusted by the moon that that's being uh, 
improperly counted whether it's that or not the point is i still believe the time frame of nissan with the barley abib will still be the beginning of the year and when i say that i'm saying that yes that's the start of the year but i believe now that the reason he's been telling us taurus and taurus has always been the beginning to the lord like it was in the beginning in genesis 1 like the meaning in the beginning in john chapter 1 is because when this starts it will be taurus as it was in the beginning all of the end of days will begin with the pre-trib escape and it will be in taurus not because so much taurus is the beginning of the year but because the lord is beginning at the feast of weeks because the feast of weeks is the first fruits of the wheat harvest those with leaven those that are brought to the lord with leaven okay we're going to go into those things today and and we'll we'll try to discern it a bit more so that you guys are now i mean you understand where i'm going with this in this first part anyways that as much as people may not like it here we are right now on the hebrew calendar the first day of adar or february 22nd and a lot of people are saying oh purim maybe account no it's not purim it's not passover it's not first fruits it's not unleavened bread this is the feast of first fruits is fulfilled already by the lord okay those who go next are the first fruits of the next harvest those who are as christ hello those who are what spirit filled hello right those who are the first fruits co-heirs as christ and the scriptures i don't think could be any more clear for us than telling us it's the first fruits of the wheat harvest it's straightforward to the wheat harvest now you say well if it was straightforward to the wheat harvest why were we so concerned in this time for the wheat harvest because we thought i believed that john 4 was leading us into understanding four months early was when the feast of first uh the feast of wheat right the the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest would be observed that's why okay along with um uh, uh leviticus 19. well those all of those options all of those possibilities are gone and as you guys know in relation to the chapters to years this is why john chapter 4 for a long time i would leave in the background and i wouldn't bring it up because i didn't think it would apply because you see in relation to john in chapters to years it equals four years ago or almost four complete years ago so I, you know, in the chapters to years, it didn't have relevant any uh, any connections to the time that we were looking at. But it didn't mean it still wasn't possible. So I was still looking at it, especially as we were coming up to the New Year of Trees. And I was, man, I was sold as much as I could possibly be. In fact, I was so sold, I, I've been, I was pretty ticked off the last little bit. You know, especially the last video that most of you never got to see and i deleted it so you're not going to get to see it and the reason was because you know i was in prayer of course i was in prayer with the lord and i'm saying lord if you know if i'm not supposed to do this you know please can you show me something can you it's just you and me nobody would even know it's not even the i won't even do the video you know some sort of sign maybe maybe uh something would pop up on my phone or i'd look at something and there would be a big no for a sign somewhere I don't know anything, but there wasn't. And so I did it believing, oh my goodness, this is the last possible connection to the new year of trees with counting for the moon. And now we're getting this. And I was certain it just looked so perfect in the 70th year, but it wasn't. And so I was, I was disappointed. I was, I was fairly sad because 
I the the point was I I thought, Lord, why can you, why couldn't you have just said, you know, given me a little something, so that I wouldn't do it, and not get people that do see it sad or disappointed, and me to be disappointed by it, right? So I was a little bit sad in that sense, but I'm not sad when I look around the things in the world and and what's going on. I'm not sad when I consider all of the things that he's given us to reveal and to understand in the is to come in this ministry. I'm not sad by those things. Those are the most glorious things in his word that he has revealed to us. It is absolutely mind blowing. Okay, so get back up on that horse. And what do we do? First thing I'm reminded of, right on target. Taurus. He's like, I've given you one thing by the Spirit, and in brackets or in quotations for you, right on target. That that video was all about being right on target from two and a half years ago. And it was the 50, 14 years and 50th Jubilee. What did it point us to? Taurus. So, what were we looking at? When we were looking at this in the 50 days beginning, we were looking at the connection into Nissan and, of course, with the adjustment for the moon. But what he's telling us with Taurus isn't Nissan. What he's telling us with the beginning isn't Nissan. He's telling us the beginning is Taurus. And Taurus is when the sun is in Taurus, which is the month of Sivan. Now, as I said, we might have to adjust from the 15th to the 21st, 15th of Sivan to the 2nd of Tammuz because of the sun. Uh, sorry, sorry, because of the moon and the moon having gone off course and the adjustments that the Jews don't make on an annual or monthly basis. They only do it every two to three years as we've taught on. So it might even go to June 21st. But when he's telling us about the beginning, I've come to realize and understand that that beginning isn't Nisan. He's telling us Taurus. In the beginning was Taurus. Christ is the beginning. The pendant he was wearing was this eye, which is called Ayin. Taurus represented as one Aleph. And the other eye represented as noon, which means the 14th letter, which is the 14th brightest star. And right on target, it represents 50. And the 14th Hebrew letter means 50. Okay. He was telling us, Taurus, 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 what are you guys missing? It's Taurus, Taurus, Taurus. And here we were, here I was. The blame is on me, right? The blame is on me as we diligently seek and try to discern these things. Right? As the teacher, the blame is on me. I accept it. But you see, I believe wholeheartedly. I actually believe personally 100% that we are in the 70th year. We have exhausted every single possibility and know that we're in the 70th year. So now what's left? Well, some people may want to say, oh, it's going to Nissan. And that's the beginning of the year. That's not what he told us. That's not what he made known to us. He made known to us Taurus. And in the beginning was Taurus, which is why the Jews' first letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Aleph, which represents the head of Taurus, which is why Jesus was even wearing the pendant that technology has been able to show. Who is the beginning? Jesus is the beginning. Now look at this. When you see these connections, it gets really exciting because this 7225 is the first fruits. This is the feast of first fruits, as all of you guys know. In Leviticus 23, he is, of course, the feast of first fruits. You see, there it is right there. 7225, just like the word in the beginning. That's how you know that in the beginning God created. That means in Christ God created. 
meaning christ created it all in the father's will in his way in his words jesus did nothing but what the father instructed him to do he was given the blueprints and said son have at it christ is the beginning and the beginning first fruits is taurus do you realize that there's only another feast uh, another first fruits and it's this one right here 1061 it's of crops and fruit by the way interesting right crops and fruit i believe there is a connection to not only the worker bride the first fruits but i believe the connection will also be a future thing connected with the 144,000. We'll leave that for the, the end of seals time. So for anybody that's new in this ministry and you're starting to hear things like 14 years and who the gospels are speaking to, I'm gonna cover this just very quickly for you. You're gonna wanna come to this playlist right here, click on, click on the Revealed End Time Study Note series and it's going to blow your mind. This is where you get the beginning of the meat and potatoes. Two 30-minute Bible studies with about six to eight or nine pages that I talk through and explain from Scripture that you can also find in the description box under the video, or you can also go to ministryrevealed.com and print off all the documents there for free. Every video that you see on YouTube is also there. Um, we have a forum that people join from all over the world, over 1,100 people, all like-minded brothers and sisters, keeping watch, sharing Bible studies, prayers, all sorts of things going on, news and events, keeping everything up to date. You can go there and join us for free as well. It'll take you a few seconds to, to join up. But these three videos are the beginning of your mind-blowing understanding. If you've ever questioned, and if you've ever read the Gospels, then you most certainly have asked the questions why does it seem like there's so many contradictions? It's never been able to be explained before, but it started and has happened in this ministry. And it begins with this little intro. When you go to ministryrevealed.com or you go into the description box under these videos, you can also download the book on PDF for free or go to the website and download it or listen to it or download it in five languages or, or buy the book from Amazon if you'd like uh, the paper to flip through. But what you're going to find out is going to blow your mind because anybody who has spent any time in Scripture and studied the Gospels, everybody who has, everybody, 100% of everybody who has, has noticed that there were the differences in the Gospels about the same stories. And we've all been told, well, it's just perspective. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. And this video is going to reveal it to you. It's going to begin to reveal Chapter one of the book will go deeper in depth. Chapter two of the book will reveal the end time timeline. Okay. You're going to realize that Luke is written to the bride of Christ, the, the, the Gentile bride, those who are spirit filled in Christ, repentant, loving the Lord, diligently seeking him. That is the Luke group. Never any condemnation spoken against them. The Mark group are those who are going to remain for the seven years of seals. The rapture of the mid-trib is going to happen in the seventh year of seals. It sounds crazy, but you're going to understand that pre, mid, and post are all true. And this, this Mark group, like the gospel of Mark, is speaking to the world. It's, it's the world as a whole, the, the house of Israel that the Gentiles have been grafted into. That is that that's the group that's going through seals it says they've erred it says they're going through tribulation okay and the matthew group is the seven years of trumpets some people think well where's the matthew group during the seven years of seals if theirs is the seven years of trumpets well it starts when the when the 50 days are over and the 14 years of tribulation begin jerusalem is attacked by syria and those with syria coming from the north will compass them about and destroy them there will be many killed many will flee into the mountains and many will be taken captive and for the next seven years jerusalem will be at rest except for a select group of people chosen to be brought in to start rebuilding 
of which they will only get the foundation laid for the temple during the time of seals. Nothing else will get built because when the Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion at the end of seals, he is going to be there with another. He is going to be with the 144,000 as the high priest and king. And another one, the modern day Zerubbabel, who will lay the foundation, is going to be the one to build it when the Lord is there. It is not going to be the Antichrist. Everybody has it twisted. And why do they have it twisted? Because they have never understood who the Gospels are speaking to. When you begin to understand what I am telling you in these videos, in this second one, you're going to realize the reason for the discourses sounding very different in Luke's and quite a bit different within Mark and Matthew, but yet similar, you're going to understand for the first time in your life that because you now begin to understand that they're written to different people, you're going to realize that the different people they're written to are to different periods of time. That Mark's uh, uh, discourse is written to seals and Matthew's discourse is written to trumpets. And when you come to watch this video and begin to understand that the tribulation is 14 years and it will end with the final 50th year jubilee, you will be blown away because many people who study prophecy also wonder how on earth everything is going to be able to fit into seven years. The answer is it's not. And what the world has done is they've mashed it all together because in this third revelation video, you're going to see it's all because of Matthew. For hundreds of years, we've been taught from the gospel of Matthew. And as being taught from the gospel of Matthew, everybody only sees from a seven-year perspective, which is Judah's. And they miss the church, the world, the house of Israel, Gentiles grafted in, the church that's asleep in the church, that, that aren't watching, that aren't ready. They will endure seals. All right? But their glory, they still have paradise coming if they remain in them. Okay? This is what you're going to understand. Because we've all been taught from a foundation of Matthew, from the seminaries, for, from the churches for hundreds of years, because they don't know this revelation. Everybody has been taught with a foundation of Matthew. And so anything they see pre, mid, or post, they try to bundle it into one and call it pre. Others will say, no, look, it's all bundled. It's actually mid. And others will say, no, look, it's post. You're going to find out. The answer is pre, mid, and post are all true. The Luke group goes 50 days before the 14 years begin. The Mark group goes in the seventh year of seals. And the Matthew group at the end of trumpets when the Lord returns. At the end of the sixth year of trumpets, the Lord will return at the start of the seventh year of trumpets. Right? End of the sixth, start of the seventh year of trumpets. And that beginning of the 14th year will deal with the enemy, with Satan, all that stuff. And that's his return feet down. It is pre, mid, post, and they're all true. And you'll begin to understand how all of this comes together and how it was missed from right here. You'll be able to come down here and see the discourses revealed and see the understanding of Luke, Mark, and Matthew in order during the tribulation. But it will make no sense until you first begin to understand who the Gospels are speaking to. All right? It's going to be... I promise you, I, I tell it every time, I promise you, if you spend that time in those videos, you will be blown away because the differences in the Gospels is the revelation of the mystery within them. You see, like Ecclesiastes, what is it? One nine, what was shall be. That's the Old Testament. What is shall be. So both what was shall be and what is shall be. Meaning the Old Testament and the New Testament both will play out in typologies of prophecy. And that's what we've revealed here. It's absolutely incredible. So with that, I also want to remind everybody, you know, I, I think a lot of times when we're coming up to some serious, serious watch dates, especially like this was, um, a lot of people just think, well, the ministry won't need any support. and so. Most people don't. Not that we have a lot of people supporting in the first place, um, you know, like eight, 10 people in a month. But those that do, 
thank you. I appreciate it. I've seen some that have come in. Uh, I always like to give a, a thank you response to it because, I don't know, it's just the Canadian Christian in me. We appreciate it. We're grateful for it. Um, but I just wanted to give a reminder because I also know um, that many support the ministry that we support over in Uganda with our brother Steve. We don't want that to stop. We want to keep supporting them too. But I want to remind everybody that the ministry still needs support too. All right. So, and especially now, because now that it's dwindled down to a few hundred bucks in the account, I want to remind everybody because we still got some time to go, it looks like. All right. We still have some time to go. For all of you guys who have been following for a while, you know, you know the revelation of Taurus. I, it, we've made it very clear, right? It's not a mystery here in this ministry. We've talked about it a lot. Taurus is the beginning. And so if Taurus is the beginning and Taurus is the time of the Feast of Weeks, and we've been able to prove the revelation of 717, right? Remember, 717 is like the Lord God's name, right? So from right to left, looks like 7, 17. We've talked about that many times. We know that is actually the revelation of the end of days. Seven years of days, right, as years that are called affliction, which relate to the seven days of Passover. You have the one-day feast of weeks, which is called the beginning. And then you've got the seven, uh, seven days as years. Two, whoops, the, yeah, the seven days as years of the Feast of Tabernacles, right? Where is it? There it is right here, of the Feast of Tabernacles, of which it has an eighth day, which is what? The final Jubilee. What's the beginning? Feast of Weeks is the beginning because the Feast of Weeks is the first fruits. So you have this beginning. It is Taurus. It's the beginning. It's the, the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest. It's Shabua. When the 50 days are over, after the escape and these events of the wedding in heaven, of the Lord returning with his, uh, the, the, the gathering of the disciples, the apostles there and the disciples, we're going to talk about this in more detail today, the, the apostles and then the disciples that are there and the disciples that follow him and the anointing that they get. And then when he, the Son of Man leaves at the end of 40 days, and then there's a, the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and then the 14 years begin. What are the beginning? What's the beginning of the 14 years? It's like the seven days typology of Passover. It's going to be seven years of seals. And when is the rapture group going to come in? The rapture group comes in in the seventh year of seals. It'll be done after six. There's going to be events taking place during the first part of the seventh year, and they will be brought into paradise in the seventh year of seals. The Lord makes a covenant at the end of the seventh year of seals, and the seven years of trumpets begin. When the seven years of trumpets are over, I keep mixing it up. Where is it? Well, sorry, when the seven years of trumpets, which is as the seven days of tabernacles are over, it's the eighth day, which is the final jubilee. So you have a, a pre-trib, a 50-day period. The 14 years begin with seven years of seals, the rapture at Passover. Then you have the seven years of trumpets. And the Lord's return deals with the enemy, renews the land. And the 14 years, the seven of trumpets is over as tabernacles today's. And then the eighth day is the new beginning, is the Jubilee. You see, we've got this. This, this is in all of our stuff, right? Except we don't show like the actual 50-day number here, but it's the last 50 days of this seventh year. Then you've got seven years of seals seven years of trumpets in this seventh year of seals is the rapture at passover the lord returns at the end of the 13th feet down or you could say at the start of the 14th feet down 
Satan is bound, destroyed, everybody that came against, he renews, replenishes from the throne. And what's the final? Like the eighth day of tabernacles? You see? Like the eighth day of tabernacles. There it is. The Jubilee year. So we've understood these things and we've understood them in an order. It starts with the beginning. So when we've looked at these things like the seven days of Passover, the one day of the Feast of Weeks, and the seven days of Tabernacles, then the eighth day new beginning, what do, what do we see? 717. It's like the middle is the podium, right? Like Jesus on the cross even. First position. Second position was the guy to his right, our left looking at him, and he, he was told he would go to paradise. What's What was the last one, right? It's, it's all of these typologies that we can see throughout. So these are things that we've understood. So when we look at this now and we understand and we say, ah, he's not telling us beginning as the beginning of the year. He's telling us it's going to begin in the beginning. And the beginning was Taurus. As good as, as the connections we're looking and everything that we had to the new year of trees, I don't know fully what that count was for, except maybe to help us understand how to count the 70 years. In fact, let's go there in a little side note. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe that was a big key for us to understand. Because we understand this. I mean, when I said that we have understood it, when I said this is fully understood, it is fully understood, just not the application of it to meaning the end of days beginning. The understanding of it is when they came into the land and they planted all manner of trees. Well, they didn't plant till they came in the land in 1948. They didn't plant till February of 49. Then their government that was elected didn't take office till March of 49. Hence the start of the year. So what do we see with this? Well, we can understand by coming to this and seeing in the fourth year and in the fifth year that, that the year and how it was counted wasn't a start from 1948, but was a start from 1949. You see? It was to help us at the very least understand that the count was from 1949 because they couldn't have been in their fourth year and praising for the planting of trees and it still be in the first year. No, it would have had to say the second. You see, they couldn't have been in the first year to the Lord or in the fourth year and in their fourth year. It, it didn't line up. And that's what 1948 would have done. So with the understanding of 1949, it has helped us. But would appear even though Nisan and Abib is the beginning of the year, the Lord isn't telling us beginning because of the beginning of the year. He's telling us beginning as Taurus. Taurus is the beginning. Why is he telling us Taurus is the beginning? Because the Feast of Weeks is in Taurus. And like I said, the only question that remains within it is he going on the Hebrew calendar, actual, uh, um, not what they do. it. You know, they call it Shavuot up here. We're going to talk about this a little bit more as we go in detail. You know, they put Shavuot up here. At the very least, it would be the 8th of Savan. But if you count it from the end of Passover week and number your sevens, it goes to here. And we've talked about this in the past, <clears throat> that to get one week out further to the 15th of Savan, it doesn't put it at a random date like the 6th, or even random, somewhat random like the 8th, because you have the two feasts of the Lord that are at the 15th and 15th, and you have the middle one at a random one? I don't think so. I believe the count is the week after Passover. So you've got your seven Sabbaths, right? And you begin to count, but your first Sabbath is after the Sabbath of the week of Passover. Why would why would Sabbath number one 
be counted as as the last day of Passover. That's how the Jews get to this in counting 49 to 50. And that's how you would get it to here if you use their count, but counting the true Sabbath days. Doesn't really make any sense. Why would why would it start in Passover? I don't believe it does. If it does, well, then maybe this is a possibility. But I don't believe so. We've shown it through um, Exodus chapter 19, right? When he when they they had fled, and on the same day they arrive at the mountain. The right on the same day, third month, which means the fifteenth day of the third month, like this one right here. They got to the mountain. The Lord said, yet three days, and then there was seven days, and then there was 40 going to the mountain. You had, you had a typology of 50 days being played out. So I do believe it was the 15th of Savan. But when the Lord obviously told Moses that in, in Exodus chapter 12, it was in Taurus, <laughs> right? It was in Taurus, and Passover week would have begun right here on the 15th of Savan. But with the adjustment, of course, of the sun being off by two months now, Everything happens earlier with the sun, which is acceptable because that is where harvests begin. So it's acceptable. The difference is the moon that is off course that we have shown every single month in a 10-year showing up to 2024. I did it from 2015, I think, to 2024 and showed the counts from the 15th of Savan and the 15th of Kislev really go to the solstice every single year is how many days the the month is off because of the moon so the question remains for us is it here or is it here you see what's what's really interesting about this question now is that if you say to here which makes sense because at the year's end of the circuit of the sun guys remember that one all right i think we all remember that one right when it says in uh, Exodus 34, 22, and thou shall observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Well, of course, one of those years ends, it means a completion in a circ or a circuit of the sun. So if the Lord is calling this beginning, well, then it's end and beginning. And this is the circuit of the sun. But why isn't it in Taurus? You see, Taurus will have already just finished going by. It wouldn't be in Taurus anymore. Well, we have to remember that we've been in Taurus now for quite a while, and Taurus is starting to slowly drift forward, right? It would eventually go three months too far. So I'm saying all this to say, you know, I don't know if it's going to be really here or if it's going to be down here because we've got a lot of scripture in telling us in relation to this time right here okay so i would be looking anywhere in here taurus 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 he has given us taurus to tell us the beginning and here's the other thing in this taurus beginning we know to the lord god it's the beginning we know when christ was in the beginning it was taurus we know when he told Moses it was Tor it was in Taurus. So when we're looking to, oh, where's the 70 years and all of that, right? It's still got to be in this time frame. The, the biggest crazy mystery for us is where this 70 years ends. And if Taurus is the beginning, does it mean that the 70 years comes to an end in Taurus? I still don't think so. Do you know why? Because the 50 days have to come first. You see how crazy it gets? The 50 days still come first. So it brings us back to Genesis chapter 1 and saying, well, what about Taurus being the beginning? Well, Taurus is the beginning. But remember, this is the these are the two verses in the in the gap theory that play as what? They play as a typology of the first 7,000 or seven days, but they're also like a Luke discourse typology. They're, they're the 50-day period of time. It begins in the beginning, which is Taurus, but when the 14 years start, you see, 
That will be the end of 70 years. It's pretty wild, isn't it? It really, it, it, I, I can fully understand why it's hard for some people to follow. But all essentially that I'm saying is the Lord has been telling us for a long time now, Taurus is the beginning. That's it. Taurus is the beginning. Is he using Taurus Savan, the third month of the Hebrew calendar Savan? Is he using Taurus Savan, is the question, as the beginning like Nisan and things are going to count out like Nisan? And this would be like, this would be Passover and this would be the feast of, of, of um, unleavened bread. And then the count goes, you know, seven Sabbaths, which brings us to right here. And then this begins the 50th day and the start of the 14 years. Or sorry, sorry, the 50th start of the 50 days, which brings us to Tishri 1. And then this is the start of the 14 years. You see, we've talked about this last year. We've talked about this before more than once, right? I believe that is a possibility. But then that would mean <laughs> that the bride doesn't go at the quote-unquote technical feast of weeks called the beginning. Are you following? You might have to rewind and rewatch parts of it. Okay, so either the beginning of the year is Nissan, and he's counting it out like Nissan, moon adjusted or not, and from here to here is the pre-trib escape as the Feast of Weeks the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Or he might be telling us that Taurus is the beginning, meaning as a Nissan type month one, and it's going to play out now as the feasts and the way they should be counted. For which if they are, this is the 49th, uh, not the 49th, the seventh Sabbath, and it makes this day one of 50. And this has always been very intriguing to me because that would mean this is the escape of the bride right here, which also is a typology of an attack on Israel in history. And we know that there's one attack coming first, a light affliction in northern Israel. Even though this was a Jerusalem attack, this would be a typology of an attack coming on them. And what do we know happens exactly 50 days later? Bam! The beginning of the year. They are, after all, the house of Judah in the land of Israel right now. And the house of Judah, as we've talked about many times with accession and non-accession, counts their kings from Tishri. So it is possible. It's very possible. And I'm doing, I'm I'm putting together a video on things that we've touched on before. Um, what we've talked on several times. In fact, I spoke about it with uh, my wife just recently. I spoke about it with Mike in the last week or two over on 165 in how it's very interesting. In fact, even with uh, our brother Chris had posted something in the forum today and uh, or yesterday and, we, and I was chatting about something I was I was looking at and putting together for a video and it was why so much time is spent on a story that goes from here to here in history. A story that lasts about 50 days and is even observed by Jews to this day with the fast of Gedalia. We have reference of it. So if you go through the stories of the first uh, of the kings, in Israel and in Judah, some of them it says that he served three months and he was done and he was way above it. And there's so many. But for some reason, there is one story in relation to Israel being surrounded and attacked and to a, a decree being made and, and Cyrus stepping in and, and letting them go to start to rebuild and then Ishmael coming and and bringing a destruction and i mean we have it in zechariah we have it in second chronicles 
We have it in many chapters throughout Jeremiah. We've got it in Daniel. We have it in, uh, where else? Do we, in the book of Ezra. It is littered throughout the Old Testament. Chapters and chapters of this storyline that relate from the ninth of Av to the first of Tishri. I believe there's a reason. I've believed there's a reason for a long time. Now, the only way this would really play out is, and, and it plays out essentially perfectly, if we count as the Lord God using the beginning as Taurus and counting it out as the beginning of his year the way he counts. Does it mean that Nisan over here isn't Nisan? No. I'm just saying where he's counting it as Taurus as it was in the beginning. And if that's the case, then we wouldn't go till around the 26th or 27th of July. That sounds brutal at this time of year, right? That sounds brutal. You see what temperature it is down here? It's minus 26 degrees. I have the heater. Come on now. I have the heater right beside. Oh, my goodness. Get out of here already. There we go. I have the heater full blast right beside me, like 10 inches away. So <laughs> I'm, I'm warm enough and I got my big leather jacket on. So I'm, I'm toasty in my little booth. But look at this. Minus 26, brothers and sisters. And I'm still here doing these videos in my garage, all right? So at least it's only for a couple more days, and then we're good, and then it goes back to zero, all right? We can endure. I'm Canadian for crying out loud. Anyways, so is this possible? Is that maybe why there is so much information in the scriptures on that storyline? Because remember, what was shall be. What is shall be. It is all typologies. So this would be, <laughs> at this point, this is what we would call a worst case scenario. It's what we would call a worst case scenario, right? Because if you look into things, let me show you something here. I think I had this for something else. But when you look into the wine harvest, look at the wine harvest. August into October. Okay, so for the grape harvest for the grape harvest when the new wine would be ready in that grape harvest and then it has to sit for a little bit right and then just that new wine is ready for for that typology in uh, in acts chapter 2 well the new wine when is it going to be ready septemberish right august to october right this is when they begin to harvest it. They actually harvest throughout all of this time. So in the ancient times, that's the, the time frame we're looking at. So, you know, it's funny, <laughs> not really, but it's funny looking back on certain things now. When we look back on this and, and was so like, man, this has got to be it. You know, why did we do it? Well, because of John. John, not, not only. One of the big connections was because of John in all of these things that related to it. So it definitely had its connections. But when we look at other pieces that kind of just drift off into the background and we forget about, where would we get the wine from 50 days later? What would anything have to do with the wine harvest and being ready with the wine? You see, it's so easy to get going in another direction from things that we see. Many of them are valid, but this is why people will go from event to event to event to event to event throughout the whole year. You see, we don't do that and we're not going to do that. I know people within the ministry are probably going to keep doing it, but that's not what you're going to see here in this ministry. From Hanukkah to this time was the time we were looking at. That's it. And there's only one other period of time that we look at. 
and it's Savan Taurus. That's it. Those are the only two connections of times of year that we look to. That's it. And now we're seeing that as we come back to this one and we do this count to where Pentecost, true Pentecost, not Feast of Weeks. Feast of Weeks is not Pentecost. We'll touch on that a bit again as well. We see that there's there's no wine grape harvest in April. You see some of those things that slip the memory, right? Because something else really catches our attention and builds on other things that we saw connected. But the truth is, we need Taurus. And so as I finish belaboring this point one more time, it'll either be Taurus Savan 15 escape or 21st pre-trib within this window right here. Or the Lord is telling us beginning and it will be counted out as if it was Nissan month one. And that would put the escape of the pre-trib down here. And we'd be connected to a very big story playing out all throughout the, uh, in much of the Old Testament, playing out with day one of 50, first attack, and day two at the beginning of the year for Judah with attack number two and then be, them being removed from the land. You guys already all know that storyline. <laughs> so it is one of these two things playing out. The Lord is telling us, Taurus is the beginning. All right? I beat that horse. <laughs> all right? We know it's Taurus. And the question within it is Jubilees and them being off by 10 days every year or really 11 and a quarter days every year that they don't adjust meaning every month there's almost a day off okay we know how to explain it we know how to show it now is that how it's going to be applied with the lord i have my suspicions that it is because we see the circuit of the sun for the lord so it very well might be but I would say this is the high watch. This is that time of the Feast of Weeks. <laughs> but you know what's really crazy is as you dig into these things and you look at when, uh, when the wheat harvest is ready, okay? The wheat harvest is 120 days. Now, what do I mean? What is the old wheat? Well, the old wheat is ready in late July. So we've got, if you go do some studies on it, you'll find that in the later part of July is when the winter wheat is ready, okay? Winter wheat, okay? Sometime even in July, because what happens is we all know the story, right? We've shared the story of the Leah and Rachel types and Leah being the older sister, that older one that he had to get first. It's the old that goes before the new. And there's two wheat harvests. There's an old wheat and there's a new wheat, which is winter wheat and spring wheat. When you plant, when they plant wheat in the spring, just uh, just around uh, Nissan time, right? Or around, you know, in uh, after spring, it doesn't take root until Passover or after Passover. And so what happens is they don't harvest that till late summer right? It's not until late summer, right? Mid late summer that the spring wheat gets harvested that was planted in the spring and they're not allowed to eat it. It's brought in, but they're not allowed to use it till the following year on the 16th of Nisan after Passover. That is the rapture of the great multitude. That is the rapture in the seventh year of seals. So how fitting is it that this count bringing us to late July and then to Tishri, even if the months or the days are adjusted by the moon, it would still be at the according time, that, that the, the 14 years would start here. Because six years later would bring us to about trumpets again 
at when the, after the 14 years have started, six years later, the Lord's coming, he anoints the 144,000, and then we know they're brought in somewhere about six or seven months later, which would be Passover time. So it seems to make a lot of sense to Passover. You know, many of you guys maybe have seen in the news, you've seen the, the little video that's played um, about someone who, uh, uh, it, was an, it, was a, it was a media thing, it was a, it was a news thing broadcast, and it was about how Moscow, the, uh, one of the, somebody who was uh, connected in Moscow was saying that Putin has been running his ammunitions and facilities for, I don't know how many years, months and months and months and months, all of their munitions factories and everything straight 24 seven constantly. Whereas America hasn't. And America is saying, you know, they're kind of getting dwindled a little bit by helping out over in Ukraine. Well, we know obviously they have more than they're saying, but America is saying that they're not running their factories like that. And what did Moscow say? It was said that Putin is ready for a 30 month war with the West and America. When that was posted in the forum, I said, oh my goodness, goodness, does, does Putin know prophecy? And we had a brother and a brother responded and he said, no, Putin's fulfilling prophecy. And do you know why that was so such a big deal for us? Because we know in this ministry that the first two and a half years, two and a half years, the first two and a half years of the 14 years of, of tribulation, the first two and a half years of seals is World War III. We've been teaching and talking about it for uh, four and a half years. I even have it right here. See that? About two and a half years is all the nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, all of that stuff. And Putin said he stockpiled for 30 months, which is what? Two and a half years of war with the West? I was like, whoa. When do we know war begins in this ministry? When does actual World War III begin? It begins at the 50 days later, which at this case would be the typology of when Ishmael came. We all know the stories of Ishmael. Ishmael, even with Abraham, is born at the start of 13 years. At the end of 13 years, God makes a covenant. Everybody gets circumcised. And in the 14th year, when he turns 100, at the 14th year, the Lord comes. The typology with Isaac being born. And then what's the story of this with the fast of Gedalia? Ishmael came with 10 leaders. He came with 10 of his leaders and their men. Like what? The 10 kings. Ishmael came and destroyed Jerusalem. That's what's coming. So it's very fitting in the typology that these things may land on their same times as appointed in history. Okay? So all of these things, guys, it's all, it, it, we're here somewhere. We're here somewhere. I was fretting. <laughs> I wasn't happy. But I'll tell you what, my spirit was just like, dude, Taurus. You know Taurus. <laughs> you know Taurus. Okay. We've got it. We've got it. We understand it. It's Taurus. Let's keep going. Let's look at some of these things we've got coming now. <clears throat> Check this out. I was doing some searching in relation to, to um, the feasts of the Lord and so forth. And I want you guys to be able to see and understand that the bride of christ is not maybe it's it hasn't been maybe for a long time the bride of christ is absolutely 100 percent unequivocally the first fruits of the wheat harvest which is the feast of weeks let me show you something on one of our charts again remember how we said the spirit group is the luke group those who are spirit filled like romans talks about um, which is that typology of in the beginning, those first two verses of create of creation. Those first two verses was the spirit portion. It was literally the, the portion of the of the spirit creation. And it says what? 
the sons of god who are the sons of god those who are in christ those who are in christ spirit filled are co-heirs with christ christ was the beginning he was a first fruits we are a first fruits it was him alone as the first fruits and you're going to see there's first fruits called them and they spirit group first light is second matthew is flesh so just think about it when you look to the to the to the festivals of the lord <laughs> and those connected to the menorah you have what well feast of weeks is the middle one which is what spirit spirit it's represented as the holy ghost right what's what's the one for light what's the mark group it's passover when christ came so those who are spirit filled have the holy ghost don't you think the connection would be connected to the holy ghost and those who are working get in filled with that power from the holy ghost what about the mark group well christ came to die for uh, uh, to save the lost sheep of the house of israel which relates to the world to the gentiles that are grafted in and he came as passover as the passover lamb when do you think he's going to take his group to paradise with them passover the ones who came to save at passover yes he came to save us all but he specifically came not for those that were already in christ right now there wasn't anybody in christ back then but in the typology he says i didn't come for those who were already prepared and anybody who was already watching he came for the lost sheep of the house of israel and who are they represented by the mark group the sleeping church the world the house of israel gentiles uh, grafted in and when did he fulfill it for them passover and what about judah what has to be filled fulfilled still for judah trumpets which relates to the father the father who created adam and gave him the breath of life and so forth create him from the dust theirs is the flesh theirs is heaven on earth so what do you have spirit light flesh you have the creation story and in the spirit light flesh creation story of the first creation spirit the second creation light in the days and the third creation flesh of the millenniums that we're in what's first spirit then you got seven relating to passover and seven relating to tabernacles well how about that 717 starts as 177 but on the cross on the cross it looked like jesus won right this guy was represented as passover and this guy as tabernacles all these typologies and now that we're back at this period of time i get excited again am i excited to wait till till savan to see what might play out at the time of savan right whether it's savan whether it's actually savan or whether it's the count begins at savan am i excited to wait that long no but what is exciting man don't we have fun digging seeking searching and bringing about more and more and more revelation as we draw closer and closer and closer i know times are brutal along the way i know it's not going to get easier for everybody for anybody closer we get the harder it's going to be but do you know what no matter what we go through it'll all be worth it it'll all be worth it as we're groaning within ourselves lord please please it'll all be worth it in that moment all will flow away and we will be literally in his presence try to contain yourself then <laughs> again i was talking about that with mike the other day too how are you going to contain yourself the the escape happens and either you're instantly in his present presence and you're in the third heaven for crying out loud in the throne room 
<laughs> why you build your <laughs> or what if it happens or when it happens and you're a worker who remains and has to be girded about ready for the Lord when he returns from the wedding and you're aware that you're going to be now a worker and it's absolutely certain now you know <laughs> it's pretty crazy right it's 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 wild stuff we're talking about it seems like fairy tale you know imaginary things you know but it's more real than you and i sitting at our desk watching our phones on our computers than pinching your skin right now it's more real than all of it craziness okay so here's what we have look at this in numbers 28 in numbers 28 you see that it was daily offering sabbath offering monthly offerings passover offerings look at what we get you want to see why the feast of weeks is so tricky do you want to see why it's so difficult to just pinpoint and say bang here it is let me show you in the 14th day of the first month is passover uh, is that is that hard to figure out when it is <laughs> nope 14th day how about in the 15th day for seven days is unleavened bread so from the 15th plus seven days from the 15th including the 15th is unleavened bread hard to figure out <laughs> nope how about huh where's the feast of where's the feast of first fruits there is no feast of first fruits here just goes first day to the seventh day tells you what to do and it goes to the feast of weeks well why don't we have what leviticus tells us in leviticus 23. in leviticus 23 you've got the feasts of the lord it talks about the sabbath it talks about passover and within passover it also says see 14th day 15th day and then you get the feast of first fruits what do you get at the feast of first fruits well there's jesus again right 7225 because of course jesus was the first fruits he himself right the first fruits you'll notice it's the first fruits right the lamb without blemish you're going to see this the lamb without blemish you're going to see something else where there's seven lambs without blemish <coughs> do you think they're at tabernacles do you think the without blemish is related to any other one but maybe the feast of weeks you're going to see feast of weeks without blemish just as feast of first fruits without blemish you're going to see feast of first fruits christ and you're going to see feast of first fruits feast of weeks <coughs> okay so do you see a, a date here the feast of first fruits has no day it's just when you bring in the sheaf of first fruits and of your harvest and unto the priest and it's to be weighed and then we get to feast of weeks what does feast of weeks say there's no date it's always a count seven sabbaths see seven sabbaths shall be complete even unto the morrow after the seventh sabbath shall you number which means count 50 days we've talked about this a number of times in the past this is not <coughs> excuse me just saying after the seven sabbaths is the 50th day there would be no reason to put an s on it it wasn't done by mistake because you can come up here and it says the 14th day the 15th day if this was meant to be the 50th day it would have said even unto the morrow after the seventh sabbath seventh sabbath shall you number the 50th day but it didn't say that it says shall you number 50 days look at this semi colon let me show you this for all the the english people out there we've talked about it in the past right a semicolon can be used to connect two closely related independent clauses 
as part of a sentence that could also stand as a separate sentence. My car broke down this morning, semicolon. It's being fixed at the mechanic's garage now. So, so what's going on here? It's, it's telling you what you're going to do on this day. Okay, so what's it saying? On the 50th day, okay, so after the seven Sabbaths, shall you number 50 days? And when, com, semicolon, and, meaning and on that day, just like I had in my car today, it broke down, it's at the shop. So my car broke down at some point in the day, and now it's at the shop in the same day. This same type of thing is going on. It's a continuation, but it's separating the events taking place. So you're going to begin to count 50 days. And on that day you begin to count, what are you going to do? And you shall offer a new meat offering. This is really interesting because this word new in relation to um, uh, feasts is only used, check this out. Where is it? Is only used for the Feast of Weeks. It's a new meat offering. There's the one we were just looking at in Leviticus, and you're going to see it in Numbers 28 as well. Okay? So we see that it's going to be a new meat offering on the beginning of day 50, right? That four, that, that seventh Sabbath into day 50, which may go as far as late July. Okay, to that ninth, eighth to the ninth of Av, depending on the side of the world. We've known about this. It's not a big surprise to us. We've shared on it before, right? That that time is possible. But if we fully understand the 70 years, like I believe we have, and I, I'm certain we've we've proven it as, as possibly proven possible, which is what Leviticus 19 helped us with, then the furthest the 14 years can begin is at um tishri one so now look at this what else do we see here okay to wave loaves they shall be baked with leaven well christ was the first fruits right and christ as first fruits was without leaven he was the first fruits and he was sinless and so there's no leaven this one is a new meat offering it tells us when it is without giving a specific date. Well, isn't that interesting? It did the same thing for us in the first fruits feast. So you've got the feast of first fruits without a specific date. It says it's uh, without leaven and it's first fruits without a specific date. And then we come to the one for the first fruits of the weed harvest, and it doesn't have a specific date given. It's with leaven because we're not perfect, yet we are also first fruits. You see? Yet we're also first fruits. And what else are we with first fruits? Without blemish. Without blemish. You know what's interesting? Why does it have seven lambs? Christ was the only lamb without blemish, right? And now there's seven lambs. What do I believe these seven lambs relate to? I believe these seven lambs relate to the seven churches in their typologies. Because within the seven churches, as you guys recall, let me just go to one real quick. Within the seven churches, even though each of the seven churches prophetically in the end of days represent a period of time in a group of events and people taking place, Throughout history, there's always been people that are associated unknowingly with one of the seven churches. So even though now we're living in the age of Laodicea, do you think everybody living during the age of Laodicea is sleeping church and unprepared? Do you think everybody on earth is lukewarm and not ready to go pre-trib? No, of course not. There's a representation of a portion of everybody that is represented by the seven churches, even right now. And when it all plays over again, there will be people during the tribulation time when everything begins 
that are a representation in typologies throughout the tribulation that represent those seven churches. And what do we have within, and why do I say that? How can I show this? Because even though in the is that we're still a part of, which means from Christ until the moment of the escape, we are still in the is. And we're in the is right now of Laodicea. But within these seven churches, of which there are people from a variety of these churches, nobody really knows who they are, only the time of Laodicea that we're living in. But every one of these churches has what? To him that overcometh. Okay? Where's another one? Uh, to him, him that overcometh. So all the seven churches, <coughs> excuse me, have him that overcometh. Okay? Him that overcometh. It's all throughout the seven churches. And so when we're looking at this, <coughs> excuse me, in numbers, and we see whether it's numbers or actually, let me let me continue in Leviticus. Whether it's in numbers or when we see it in Leviticus, I believe what we're seeing is this typology with the seven lambs being the connection of those who are a part of those seven churches living in the is, okay? Because some people are evangelists right now. Some people are just living in tribulation and being persecuted right now, okay? There are people that are in types of this within the church that is going to go pre-trib who I believe are represented as the overcomers in the seven churches. And I believe that's the typology of why we have seven lambs without blemish. So we are like Christ, but we have leaven. And yet we're first fruits. We are a new meat offering. and Yet at the same time, we're without blemish. How can leaven still be without blemish? Right? This is, I know this is baked. This has to do with the bread, right? With the wheat. But how is it that sin and non blemish within the same feast is observed like that? Because we've been made clean. The first fruits of the wheat harvest, which is the bride of Christ is made clean. Let me go to it. Okay? Without blemish. So where do we see these places? Look at this. In Leviticus 23 and Leviticus 23. So 12 and 18. When we go to the wording without blemish, see? In first fruits, feast of first fruits, a he lamb without blemish. Where else do we see without blemish? Seven lambs without blemish they may be, maybe they're even a, a a higher up typology in relation to the seven angels that are over the seven churches during these past two thousand years maybe that's their representation as well but in a lower level they still are represented over their churches in the is that we're still dwelling in and there are people from among all of them so only feast of first fruits and feast of weeks have a first fruits and have the term without blemish. Do you think that's significant? That two of those terms are, are in the same connection? I believe it's very significant. <clears throat> See, it even goes on to say it more here. Okay, it's very significant. We've proven that this first fruits is obviously the bride of Christ. What do we know about this first fruits? Let's go have a look. Uh, Romans, I think it's Romans, is it eight? Yeah, it is eight. We know from Romans eight. Let's go look at Romans chapter eight. We'll start at the beginning. Just so, so we can see this connection. What does it mean, those without blemish, okay? Without blemish. So Christ, of course, is without blemish. But how on earth can those with sin, with leaven, still be without blemish? 
right? Complete, whole, sound, uh, is complete, in accord, okay? But to be without blemish, to be made whole, how is that possible? Right? That can only be to a group that has no condemnation. Do you realize as the bride of Christ, there's no condemnation? Do you realize as the pre-trib group going to the third heaven, there's no condemnation? There's no judgment room for you at the end, judgment throne. There is no condemnation to this group. Who is this group? Well, let's have a look. Here is therefore, uh, there is therefore now no condemnation. Okay, let's look at the word. No condemnation. Okay, no adverse sentence. Okay, no judgment against, no judge against. To them which are in Christ Jesus. We know there is only one group in Christ Jesus. And it's the Luke group. Remember, they, the, the Mark group has error. The Matthew group has error. Mark has tribulation in it. Matthew has tribulation in it. Luke does not. The, those who are in Christ are the very famous ones that we talk about here all the, regularly that we've talked about for five years. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years. What's the above? 50 days. Above 14 years ago. Where does this one go? Well, it's going to be like a rapture and they're going to be caught up, which is the which is like a rapture, and they're going to the third heaven. This group's going to the throne room, guys. Then you see such a man, meaning not as in Christ as this one, but, you know, knows the Lord, believes in the Lord, loves the Lord, wasn't diligent, wasn't, wasn't you know, wasn't ready, was kind of asleep. And where does he go? It's the was caught up, and they're the ones going to paradise. This is the rapture of the great multitude in the seventh year of seals. But you see, this group is the in Christ group, of which there's no denying the understanding of that. We've proven it many, many times. So let's get more understanding. This group is the one are the ones that are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, because we're living in the time of the flesh, where we have flesh but after the spirit who's the spirit group huh the spirit group is the luke group who's the spirit group within the luke group right who's that spirit group those from in the beginning and it says what and the spirit of god was upon the face of the waters See, this is the time of the spirit group, the same typology in the connection, <coughs> excuse me, to the Luke group. Let's keep reading on it. For the law of the spirit of life in, uh, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Pretty clear, right? There is no condemnation, right? There is no condemnation. There's no what? They're without blemish. There is no condemnation. They are without blemish. Those who are spirit-filled in Christ. That's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> Let's continue to the rest of this because there's more really good stuff, right? Romans 8, 13, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God. Where was the spirit of God? You guys all know it. Genesis chapter one, verse two. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. 
For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby you, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. I always say this when I read this. It blows my mind. Do you understand everybody going pre-trib is a co-heir or joint heir with Christ? That's too much to handle. That The thought of that is too much. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. You see, this is what I was talking about earlier. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Okay, we've talked about this one in the past, right? The, the whole expectation of the creature waiting for the sons of God. <clears throat> but let me go down to verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, here it is, which have the first fruits of the spirit what's this conversation been about the first fruits well the only first fruit that's been so far is christ have some died over the last two thousand years in christ's spirit filled that are first fruits yes they're already in the third heaven waiting for us they're waiting those who are alive who will not taste of death when the moment comes, are the remaining first fruits of the spirit that need to be removed. And a remnant will be chosen to remain. You see? And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the spirit. So to be a first fruit, as Christ was a first fruit, but that of wheat, you must be spirit filled. You must be in Christ. You must be repentant. You must diligently seek him. You must turn from sin and repent when it sneaks in. How can you tell? <clears throat> if you're a potentially the a, a first fruits in Christ spirit filled, you're desiring the Lord like crazy. You want to be with him. And while you're here, the best way to be with him is in prayer. In prayer to him, whether over family or friends or in conversation with him, is to be seeking him in his word to draw closer. And knowing that even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to which the adoption of our body. Now, listen to this. This is always a, a punch in the nose for me. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. I can tell you I ain't always patient. <laughs> I'm sure many of you aren't always patient either, right? But you see, that's the, the whole story, right? The blessed hope. What allows us to keep going? What keeps us diligent and drawing, even though when we're like, ah, oh, I've had enough? It's the hope. It's the hope. And you know what that tells me? That people that, that have, quote unquote, been to heaven, that have seen the Lord in visitations, how could they fall away? If they've really seen and experienced these things, how could they fall away? You see? For what man seeth, why does he yet hope for? So anybody who's who has literally seen it, and I believe there are some, the Lord has visited and he's made known or have been to heaven and things like that. I think the evidence of those truths are in their life. Right? It's in their life. You could see they love the Lord. They've become on fire from the Lord after the experience. They're not just, they're not swayed by anything that happens. They would still have disappointments. Oh, there might be sin that creeps in sometimes. 
but they're repentant. They're strengthened in the Lord. Why? Well, they don't have to even hope anymore. <clears throat> they know. They've seen it. You see? But for the rest of us, it's hope. It's hope that we patiently wait on for that adoption. That adoption as the first fruits of the Spirit. There is only one group that is first fruits of the Spirit that is not Christ. And those are the co heirs, Spirit filled, Spirit of God co-heirs with Christ. It's awesome. It's such an exciting thing to discern and say, whoa, whoa. Just the thought of that. You see, the point in this, <coughs> excuse me, the point in this is the first fruits. The first fruits is this mysterious or somewhat mysterious date of the first fruits of the wheat harvest of the Feast of Weeks, as was Christ and his. Oh, we, we can understand it was the 16th of, of the first month, just as we can understand it's the, the 15th of the third month. But there's still mystery in it that it wasn't given. Do you know when you keep going down, or we go to chapter 29, and you see the Feast of Trumpets? Look at the Feast of Trumpets. In the seventh month on the first day of the month. Was that hard one to find out? <laughs> nope. What about atonement? On the tenth day of the seventh month. What about Feast of Booths? Right? Tabernacles. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month. You see, after Christ was fulfilled, the only one that has this somewhat mysterious day where it's never given to us clear, the only one left is the Feast of Weeks of the First Fruits of the Wheat Harvest. <clears throat> now, if you remember, uh, I'm going to share again this, uh, this word for what Feast of Weeks means, right? Feast of Weeks is Shabuah. And I can't help it. You know I'm going to say it. One of Mike's favorite words, right? That's that's one of the ways I'm always reminded of it because it's one of Mike's favorite words to say it, the Hebrew Shabuah, okay, which is for Feast of Weeks. Okay, it represents weeks. Well, if it represents weeks, what if we go to Daniel chapter 9, weeks of what? Well, the Feast of Weeks is Shabua. So again, when we take it to Daniel 9, verse 24, and it says 70 weeks, which is what? Shabua. Well, if the Feast of Weeks is Shabua, and it's 70 weeks determined upon them, even if this, <coughs> excuse me, even if this 70 weeks, as we know, is a year's representation. Even if 70 weeks is speaking to the end with connection to Jerusalem, or if it's the 70 weeks connected to the 70 years that we're looking for, it makes no difference. The point being made is the count is from Shabua. The beginning. You see? The beginning is the Feast of Weeks. That's what the Lord has been telling us. The beginning is the Feast of Weeks. So if it begins at Shabuah, maybe we should be looking at Shabuah, Feast of Weeks. Again, this isn't something, <coughs> excuse me, this isn't something so off the wall for us. We've studied that, we've studied these things over the years. It's not a big mystery. What blows is the fact that we might have to wait till June, July to find out. But does it discredit anything in relation to the 14 years, to the, the 50 days that comes next? No. 
Nothing. How is that possible? Because we know accession and non-accession. Right? We've understood how the house of Israel and the house of Judah counted. The house of Judah is in the land. The house of Judah counted from Tishri. The Lord not beginning it really there, right? Beginning would be in the Feast of Weeks. Would be at Taurus. <coughs> Excuse me, but the beginning of the 14 years could very well be at Tishri. You see how it plays out? It's not, it's not, it can sound twisted, but not if you follow the understanding from Taurus. That it'll either be in Taurus, it starts with the escape, or it'll be in Taurus that he counts as month one. That will lead us right to Hebrew calendar dates that line up with the scriptures of when these things happen to them. You see? His time landing on their dates. That could very well be the case too. So I wanted you guys to, to grasp it. I wanted you to make sure you saw these things. You know, we know this beginning. This is the beginning. The beginning was the word, the spirit. Then it was light. Then it was flesh. Just like the three creations. All right, we did the same thing with uh, with Luke chapter 1, the beginning. What is Luke chapter 1? Well, we know Luke is in order, right? We're going to talk about Luke in a moment here, but one of the things we know about Luke is Luke 1 is related to the, the beginning, Luke knowing all things in order, and you have John's birth, which is the typology of the time of the escape, then you get to the time of the eighth day of his circumcision, which is when the Lord returns and he would start his 40 days as Luke chapter 2. That circumcision is a typology at the time of the, the John types, the John the Baptist worker types that remain during seals that put their necks on the line. And the 40 days of the Son of Man, who is the typology of what? Right? As his birth. It's like the typology of his birth, the 40 days of his birth in Luke chapter 2. So you have the pre trib and his return on the eighth day, and he starts his 40 days as the Son of Man, which is a typology of the 40 days of his birth. We've taught on these things a number of times, right? So you have what? The beginning of the 50 days. By the time his 40 days are over, 47 days have been complete because the eighth day is the beginning of day one of 40. And it leaves the three days to Pentecost. Okay? Not to the Feast of Weeks. To Pentecost. That's why it was then count 50. You see? Then number 50 days. When you get to chapter 3, we know it's the typology of him coming at the end of seals in that seventh year of seals. We've proven it. We've talked through it. We've shown it. These are all connections revealed from what he said in Luke chapter 1 that he knows all things in order. What this revelation of knowing these things in order was the story of the revelation of Luke chapter 1, 2, 3, 4. And so what's Luke chapter 4? Well, it just so happens it's when Satan tempts Jesus. When is Satan gonna, When is Jesus going to return when Satan will have been given everything and then Jesus returns and defeats him? It's at the end of trumpets. At the end of the sixth year of trumpets to the start of the seventh year of trumpets. When the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, Satan tempts him. Jesus destroys him. And there's that final battle. And he's bound for a thousand years. It's pre the, the disciples and the 40 days with the Son of Man. Then his return on heavenly Mount Zion with paradise when the world is going to freak out and hide in the rocks. Who knows what they're going to see, but the world is going to see it, and they're going to panic and hide. That's when he comes at the end of six years of seals. And chapter four is when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives. In At the end of chapter three, of course, when he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion, he's coming with paradise. And of course, that's where the rapture group's going to be taken in that seventh year of seals. It's a paradise. So you have a taking, a taking, and a returning. 
pre, mid, post, all revealed throughout the Gospels. Which then leads us to chapter 5. And we'll go to that in a moment. Okay? We're talking in this, this time of the, the escape and the 50-day count, right? The 40 days of the Son of Man and the attacks and so forth. And then we're going to push on a little bit more in the Gospel of Luke and wrap this up. So let's go back into Numbers chapter 29. Look at what we find now in Numbers chapter 29. It was an interesting side note, but I'd say even more than a side note, it's, it's quite relevant because in relation to what we were showing here, if the Lord is counting Savan without the adjustment for the moon, okay? It, it may very well be the adjustment for the moon, but without the adjustment for the moon, this would be, of course, unleavened bread. Okay? Unleavened bread, the count to the seven Sabbaths brings us to here. And on the 50th day, when you begin, sorry, and when you begin after the seventh Sabbath and you begin to count 50 days, this is the escape of the first fruits of the wheat harvest with leaven, right? They are the first fruits without blemish. And then what? Then you have 50 days. That takes you to what? Trumpets. And it's that whole story. Maybe it'll be the next video. We'll see how I play it out. But because I, I do have like two or three videos ideas going around right now in my head. But um, with this being Tishri 1, so you see if the Lord has played out events on his timeline, which was as it was in the beginning but they're landing on Hebrew dates for them to recognize, you see? And if this is the time of the Feast of Weeks on God's count, yet it's Tish, Trump, Tishri 1 to the Jews, it's the Feast of Trumpets, but the, this is when new wine would be ready and the Holy Ghost is anointing them before the attack happens. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that actually the harvest time is that time? I mean, the that the new grapes that were harvested, see, this is harvesting time, that it would be harvested and they would be ready at that time? They're not ready in winter and spring. This isn't ice wine. Right? Ice wine is very famous in Western Canada and in Vancouver. Okay? I don't drink, but when I used to. <laughs> okay? So this actually is right in line with the time of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost comes at the end of those 50 days and they were being accused of being drunk on new wine. This is the season time of new wine. But what else is it? It's trumpets. It's the Feast of Trumpets. What happened in history on this date? Ishmael, the story I was telling you about, Ishmael came, surrounded, and attacked them. And destroyed them and they they fled right they they were scattered they no longer went into the into the land right remember jeremiah and then in ezra they they bring a small group back and and they plan to to rebuild the foundation right that was by uh, um by the decree with cyrus that whole it's a whole story i'll i'll probably well not probably i will end up doing a video on that and and lay in even greater detail into it than we ever have before so we know there's a 50 days before the 14 years. And if God is counting Nisan or month one as, as Savan at Taurus, well, it lines up perfectly. Like, exactly. Counting from Savan. You see, because I have to admit, it, it, it seems strange if it was literally to go to here. It might. It might, with the adjustment for the moon. But it seems kind of odd to me. I know in, in one way with scriptures it's quite possible. But in one way it seems odd because Taurus is no longer there. Taurus is literally, the sun is in Taurus during the time of Savan. And when we do this count from the 15th of Savan, we end up with 50 days exactly to the attack. A perfect 50-day count from one attack to the second attack. Now, why does this matter? Well, this attack is the attack that happens at what? Trumpets. 
so when they're sounding trumpets right so it's the time of sounding the blowing of trumpets that's what they do at the feast of trumpets okay numbers 29 verse 1 and in the seventh month on the first day of the month you shall have a holy convocation you shall do no servile work it is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you okay so it's a time of blowing the trumpets but this year understanding the 70th the 70th and if it goes to the latest portion and it brings us after the first attack in northern the escape and the first attack in northern israel and then the time of the the wedding the the 40 days of the son of man and then brings us to the 50 days the anointing of the holy ghost and then the attack on jerusalem that removes them from the land for the next seven years it happens at the time of blowing of trumpets so in understanding this so we've got blowing of trumpets i'm going to show you in a moment we have wine we have the count for 50 days an attack one to start and an attack two to end to start the 14 years at the beginning of the year all of these things are there okay it's very interesting so now what's the point why am i sharing this in relation to continuing the storyline in numbers to the blowing of trumpets well of course we can also go into leviticus 23 and in leviticus 23 it tells us the same thing blowing of trumpets okay blowing of trumpets well do you know what happens when you do a search for blowing of trumpets uh was it shouting no see shouting we're not looking for shouting we're looking for see sound of the trumpet the alarm of war check this out you guys know this we've shared on it a while back i keep saying that but you know we've shared virtually every piece of scripture over the last five and a half years what do we see in jerusalem what are we talking about a disaster coming from the north a disaster coming from the north what is going to happen on the 50th day that we know we know it is the time of the red horse rider when peace is removed when it becomes nation against nation kingdom against kingdom it will begin absolutely wholeheartedly 100 percent with the attack and destruction of jerusalem where he's not going to completely destroy it but he's going to destroy it to have them removed from the land so that his land can rest for seven years for the years they never allowed it to rest during their during their sabbaths okay that's how it works it must rest for seven years as he told them in leviticus 26. <clears throat> so they've got to be removed the 50th day is the day we know syria will compass or will begin to compass and then attack on that third day we know it we've taught it forever it was the confirmation from the holy spirit about being right on target and what happens at the feast of trumpets the blowing of the trumpets well let's read what happens in jeremiah chapter 4 declare ye in judah and publish in jerusalem and blow ye the trumpet in the land okay a little bit further for in the same uh verse 6 jeremiah 4 verse 6 halfway through the verse for i will bring evil from the north and a great destruction the lion has come up from the thicket that's syria and the destroyer of the gentiles that's russia is on his way 30 month armament prepared how about that right we come down further verse 10 then said i ah lord god surely that was greatly deceived this people and jerusalem saying you shall have peace why because after the northern attack in israel there's going to be a declaration of peace and then peace will be removed at the attack on jerusalem by syria saying you shall have peace whereas the sword reaches the soul at that time shall it be said to this people into jerusalem a dry wind let's go a little bit further verse 15 
a voice declares from Dan and publishes affliction from Mount Ephraim, making mention to the nations, Behold, publish against Jerusalem, that watchers come from a far country and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. I believe that might even be the disciple workers, which we're going to see a little bit more in a minute, that are with Jesus during the 40 days, as keepers of a field against her roundabout, because she has rebelled against me, saith the Lord. Now, these watchers, we've taught on it not too long ago. It's it's a hidden thing as watchmen, which we've shared. That's That's what the seals workers are. When he returns from the wedding, those that he comes, it's the first watch group. He's going to have a, a, a meal with them. He's going to he's going to dine with them and serve them. And they're going to follow him for 40 days, you know, work with them, do whatever it is for 40 days. They'll receive the anointing at the 50th and then they're going to go out during seals. OK, but it could also be a representation of an angelic group. But I'm not so sure it is. I mean, we see that even in. Uh, 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 in Luke chapter 2, as the Son of Man is being born, right? The angel visits those that were in the field and the Son is born. But I believe it's it's more related to the, the hidden group of watchmen that will be made known as we read about in uh, 2 Peter 1. As keepers of a field round about. Now listen to this, verse 19. My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard, O oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. See what it means? A clamor. See, it could be for joy or a battle cry. It can be used for the jubilee. So it could be a, a, an acclamation of joy. It could be a battle cry. It can be used for the jubilee. What do you think this one's talking about? It's a battle cry. What What is in this cry? Destruction upon destruction is cried. For the whole land is spoiled suddenly. Are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment? How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? What is the word for the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Well, let's go back to Numbers. Numbers chapter 29, seventh month, first day of the month, okay, is a holy convocation. It is a day of blowing the trumpets. Okay, what day is it? Remember this one? 8643, it was Jeremiah 4 about the attack that's coming and destroying them in a moment. And they'll be removed from the land. What happens at the Feast of Trumpets? Same thing. It's the same sounding of a trumpet. So not only do we have this entire storyline. It's there in Zechariah, the fifth and seventh month. It's there in Daniel. It's there in, in Second Chronicles. It's there in Ezra. It's there in Jeremiah. All throughout these places of a short storyline to the Feast of Trumpets starting at the 9th of Av, which is perfectly 50 days apart. You see, as I was considering these things earlier today and, and debating which way I was going to go with the video today, and I was considering these things, I said to myself, you know, we've probably already discerned when this entire thing was going to happen a couple, three years ago. We just didn't yet have the year. We just didn't yet have the year. He had more revelation, more understanding, more things to lead us in. But it doesn't mean that we didn't already know it. We just didn't know that we already knew it. Because it wasn't yet the year. But here we are drawing closer and closer to these things, believing absolutely this is the 70th year now, finally understood and discerned. And we're coming back to a storyline that we already knew, but now we can build on with even greater accuracy and understanding because of the years that have followed of developing it and going closer and closer to it. 
the blowing of the trumpets at the Feast of Trumpets is the same battle cry being declared in Jeremiah 4 when the lion from the north, who is Syria, comes and destroys them. Precisely as we have understood. <clears throat> so what are the chances of a battle cry like like the sounding of the trumpet at the at the uh, um, uh, at the feast of trumpets happening in February. You see, it's these little it's these other little things along the way, right? There's so many things that account here or account there. Why did it account so much going from Hanukkah to the New Year of Trees? Why was that such a possibility? <clears throat> outside of this connection to counting to the new year of trees, the number of years. It was 50 days. It was 50 days. We were looking for a 50-day connection at a year's end, right? At a beginning, a year's end and beginning. We were looking for a 50 days that followed. You see? It only happens, It there's only an alignment with the time of Hanukkah, New Year of Trees time, and this one. But the other one doesn't have the Feast of Weeks. It had the potential of the Feast of Weeks being four months early. You see? That's why there was so much hope in that one. But it's not because that's where it was actually ready. You following? It I know it it sucks thinking we might have to go that much longer. But we'll keep doing this. We'll we'll be here for you. I've told you before. I'm going to keep doing this right to the end. Am I am I excited all the time to to want to? No, man. Sometimes it's like pulling teeth. But you know why I do it? Do you think I do it just because I I want to? <clears throat> just because oh I I can put it out there and people are following me? Yay! No. I do it because I love you guys. And I know you guys love me for the most part, <laughs> right? As brothers and sisters in Christ. This, this is my calling. This is what I do. It's not just about the date. It's the revelation of his word that leads us along the way. You see, <clears throat> it was another thing I was considering the other day, saying, Lord, could you have just taken away the desire to understand when? Right? I'm sure many of you guys have had that. What is this drive within me and within many of us that are watching like this? What is this drive to try to understand when it's going to happen? I don't get it. Can you, could you have just left that out of me? Why do we have it? <clears throat> Can't we spend our time seeking and revealing the revelation that you have made known to this ministry and just do it without trying to, to discern a, a time? Wouldn't that have been easier? Couldn't we have attracted many more people potentially? with the revelation of the Gospels and, and, and how it reveals the time of years and everything. But do you know what came into my mind as I was thinking about that? First thing that came to my thoughts was 70 years. <laughs> what? 70 years just pops into my thoughts. You know why? Because all throughout the revelation of prophecy is what? 70 years. The revelation of prophecy is filled with understanding that the end of days and the 14 years will begin when 70 years has been complete. Period. We know it. It's in Daniel. It's in Zechariah. It's in Psalms. It's, it's all over the place. It's part of prophecy. And you see what's interesting when you consider these things and you ponder on these things. 
most churches, 90 plus percent of churches around the world don't even touch prophecy. Don't even talk about being ready and watching and so forth. You see? Because it scares people. But understanding this 70s part of it, look what happened with many churches when the 70 years of Israel passed. They drifted back to sleep. Because they thought, oh, it's only 70, 70, 70. <clears throat> and so they didn't continue to diligently seek. We've been rewarded in the diligence of continually seeking the understanding of 70 because the revelation was part of it. Period. There was no way of getting around. How can you still be really excited of, of seeking prophecy yet saying, well, the 70 years has passed. I guess, I guess we'll just keep learning this stuff forever and a few people will hear it. No. Nope. We're being prepared. We are being prepared, brothers and sisters. Okay? We're being prepared. Let's go back to Luke and you'll see this preparation. We talked about chapters 1, 2, 3, 4. Right? 1, 2, 3, 4 is what Luke was talking about, that he knew all things in order. It's pre-trib. The eighth day, the workers... They'll follow the Lord for 40 days is the typology of his birth. We've showed it to Isaiah nine dozen times. His return at the end of seals and his return at the end of trumpets. When you go to Luke chapter five, what do you find? In Luke chapter five, he calls his disciples, <clears throat> right? He calls his disciples and what does he tell them? And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish and their nets break. What was this typology of? This is the workers, the seals, disciples, right? Workers and the apostles with them that are going to be the ones who bring in the great multitude. And as they bring in the great multitude, we know at the very end, the, the 144,000 will help them because there's not enough of them to bring in the fish, just like the nets broke here. You see, the great multitude is the mark group. The great multitude is a representation of the mark group that comes to Christ during seals. Is the mark group that repents during seals <clears throat> and comes to Christ. It doesn't mean it's always a representation of all of them at the same time. But when you read it in the context of Mark, uh, in the context in Luke, it's telling you it's the mark group. Some of the mark group in Revelation 7, it represents all of the mark group that came in during seals. The dead and the alive in Christ that made it or died during seals or that made it to the end of seals. That is the complete great multitude. The reference of these great multitudes is telling us a group of marked people here, a group of marked people there. And in this case, this is the beginning of the Lord coming. This is the beginning in the typology. And he's telling them they're going to bring in a great multitude. Okay? How, do, how can I prove this? How can you show that one, two, three, four were in order? Well, that's, that's a long story in itself. I explained a little bit of it. But you can see the typology by Luke chapter 5 being when he calls his first disciples. Well, what does that mean? Well, what if we go to Mark? Look at Mark chapter 1 the beginning hello do you think that's by accident do you think the beginning is right there in mark is by accident of course not of course not the bride is gone and everything begins and it's the time of tribulation it begins with the 50 days bride is gone and bang it begins the mark groups left the whole rest of the world the mark group the matthew group they're still here that's why if you're new and you go to the, the intro videos and you'll read in the differences in the Gospels of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, in Luke, when Jesus is on the cross, everybody thinks he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because everybody learns from Matthew, right? But that's not what he says in Luke. He says, Father, into your arms I commend my spirit. You see, 
and he was arrayed in white so he was given white clothing and he says father into your arms i commend my spirit that doesn't sound like my god my god why have you forsaken me so why do mark and matthew record my god my god why do you why have you forsaken me because the word forsaken means leave behind was jesus worried that he was going to be left behind of course not it was prophetic Mark and Matthew's group are going to be left behind. Luke's group is going to be received into the Father's arms. Jesus and Luke was arrayed in white. They're going to be in white in the Father's arms. The Mark and Matthew group are left behind. Mark, in Mark, Jesus was arrayed in purple. In Matthew, he's arrayed in scarlet. Both tribulation colors. How about that? <clears throat> you see? So why does it all begin in Mark? Well, look what happens. Okay, you've got the John the Baptist type. That is the worker type, okay? You see it goes into the 40 days of the Son of Man. And look at what it says. Look what happens now in Mark chapter 1. He's calling his disciples, right? Telling them fishers of men. Where did it start in, in Luke? It didn't start till chapter 5. Yet in Mark, it was in chapter 1. Because Luke 1, 2, 3, 4 was the understanding that Luke had of knowing all things in order, pre-40 days, mid and post. It's mind-boggling to read the stories with an eye of end-time understanding and to be able to see all of the typologies laid throughout it. Because what was and what is, both shall be. It is all typologies. It is all types and shadows what do you think what was and what is both shall be it's not gonna be exactly the same what's played out over thousands of years will play out over 14. that's how crazy intense the end of days will be do you see even when you go to the discourses you guys all know this but when you go to the discourses you see in luke where he says unto them Meaning this isn't going to happen to this 40, 50 day group with the Lord, right? Or, or, or happen to the bride group. He's saying, then he said unto them, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Okay. Earthquakes, famines, pestilence, all these things. But he says, but before all these. So what does he mean? But before all these, it means before nation against nation. So what he goes on to tell them about next are the things that are going to take place during the 40 days of him being here, right? That 50 and 40 days of him being here. This is what it's about. When you go to Mark, remember Mark chapter 1 said the beginning. The escape has happened and now everything's going to start. And before it gets to the Luke group at chapter 15 of choosing the disciples, you have a group of things, you have a, a, a variety of things going on of which takes place what? The beginning, which means the 50 days have now started. The bride is gone. You've got a group here preparing the way. You've got the 40 days of the Son of Man. You see? Well, look what happens when you go to Mark's discourse. In Mark's discourse, how does it start? When does it start? Right here. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Do you see any black letters where he says unto them? Nope. This is now the beginning of the 14 years of tribulation that begins with an attack on Jerusalem in World War III breaking out across the world. This entire portion of time right here is two and a half years, right? And being delivered up into councils and so forth. You see this beginnings of sorrows? That's the 30 months of weapons that Russia has. That's World War III. But let's go back to Mark chapter 1. We see that, in that beginning. We see a group prepared. We see he's choosing his disciples. Look what happens now. Like I said, there he's choosing his disciples. They're going to be fishers of men, right? They're going to be the ones bringing in the great multitude, the, the Luke group of workers. Well, check this out. Let's go to chapter 6. You ready for this? Wait until you see these typologies. Starting in verse 12. Luke 6, verse 12. 
And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose 12 whom he named apostles. Okay, something we've taught on, right? He has uh, uh, disciples and apostles. The apostles are above the disciples. But what do we know about the apostles? Well, when we go in the end time revelation of it and go into John chapter 20, <clears throat> the escape of the bride of Christ typology, and we see that Jesus returns at the beginning of 50 days, right? He returns at the same day. So at the beginning of 50 days, which is the typology in the end of days in John chapter 20, it's the beginning of it and it's the end, right? John 20 is also in the chapters to years to the end, but it's also a type in the beginning to the 50 day count, which is the escape of the bride of Christ. And then what happens in the self same day at evening? So on the same day at the escape, he comes back in the evening and what does he do? The door is shut and he anoints the apostles. He breathes the Holy Ghost onto them. He breathes the Holy Ghost onto them. They, then he leaves and he comes back again after the uh, right eight days again, he returns. Thomas is there, sees him, touches him. So Jesus is now meeting with these apostles again on the eighth day. Okay, after seven, he's gone to the wedding. He's going to return on the eighth day. And what happens? He's going to meet with the apostles first. Do you know why? Because the the parable of the of the money or of the pounds, I think it is in uh, in in Luke's story. It's the story of the pounds, the money. He gave it to the ten, right? It's a typology of him giving it to the apostles while he was gone to see what they would do while he's gone to the wedding. They were to go. They had the Holy Ghost breathed on them. They had the power and the authority, and they were gone out. He's going to take an account and see what they've done while he was gone to the wedding. He meets with them, <clears throat> and then what do we know? Then it goes to, of course, Luke chapter 24. On the same eighth day, he then meets with the disciple group, which is represented by Luke chapter 24. What does he do with the Luke 24 group? This was the group that knew he was gone to the wedding. The escape had happened. This is the remnant worker bride. This is the Smyrna group. The apostles were, uh, are the Ephesus group. And what does he do? He's going to sit and eat with them and serve them. They're going to recognize him and freak out. And then what's going to happen? He's going to open unto them their understanding, right? He's going to make known to them all things. This is the group from 1 Peter 1, right? They had never seen, never seen them. They were just joyful and excited about the Lord and being in Christ, spirit-filled. And they've been preparing for this time. And their understanding will be opened and they will go out preaching and witnessing and doing what they're supposed to do. Whatever their job will be in that time, following them during the 40 days and then their work during seals. And that's how it goes from John into Luke into Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. Okay, look what happens here in Acts chapter, in Luke chapter 6. <clears throat> He has his disciples, chooses his apostles. So now we know there are disciples and apostles. So if he's talking about apostles, he's not calling them disciples. Okay? So where are the disciples now, God? I mean, where are the apostles, brothers and sisters? What do we know about the apostles during the end of days? They were given the Holy Ghost on day one of 50 in the evening. Then he left for the wedding. He came back, took an account from them, and then what? He went to go meet with those who weren't chosen as apostles, but were disciples. Right? Then he goes to be with the Luke group. 
So now he's with the disciple group. Where are the apostles? They're out doing their thing. They're out going about the business of apostles, bringing about, you know, the, this time of revival. Christ is there, but they're also having to do their thing. They have this anointing of the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> they are the absolute leaders. And when Christ is gone, these guys are the heads. These, these are the ones responsible for the spiritual foundation being laid during seals with the disciples helping. But they're the ones who are laying a spiritual foundation when during seals an actual physical foundation is being built as well. But it's the disciples who were not chosen as apostles who go on to follow Christ during the 40 days. Not the apostles. That's why when you get into Acts, and you see in Acts chapter 1, it was the Luke group of disciples that followed him for 40 days. You see, the apostles weren't there. It was the disciples. And that's why when you get into Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2, these guys that were the disciples made their way back to Jerusalem to where the apostles and those that were with them already were. See, they weren't the ones receiving being drunken and so forth with the appearance of being drunken. It was the disciples. The apostles had already been anointed. So what do they do? They go to join them in Acts chapter 1. They go to join them in that upper room, right? They go into that upper room where the apostles already were. So it's the disciples that are following him for 40 days. They're his special group. They're his remnant bride that he's going to spend time with. Let them know that theirs is the kingdom of God, that their place is already reserved in heaven. I would think they're going to be like little puppy dogs following them, whatever they want, right? Whatever the Lord wants. They're going to be following him like little puppy dogs. So it's not the apostles following him. It's the disciples that are with them now. And that's exactly what we see. So you've got still disciples and those apostles that are now going to be gone to do their thing. Look at what verse uh, Luke 6, verse 17. And he came down with them and stood in the plain and in the company of his disciples. See that? Of his disciples. If it was the apostles here, he could have said apostles. But he said disciples. Comma and a great multitude of people. A Luke group. You see, the escape, you got to remember in the end time vision, in the end time understanding of, I could see it actually play out as I'm talking to an extent. This great multitude is the Mark group that's waking up. The escape has happened. It's been seven days. The vanishing has happened. The world is freaking out. Northern Israel has been attacked. The world's freaking out. Do not think that people who were asleep in the church will suddenly wake up? Absolutely they will. Without question, a number of people will wake up. And what do you think happens when the Son of Man returns on the eighth day to start his 40 days? He will have already met with his apostles and will make himself known to his disciples and will open unto them their understanding. And now what's happening? A great multitude of people, meaning a, a group of the marked group, is coming to hear from Christ. And he's got these disciples following him. You see, what is he going to do during this time? Remember, we've taught that when he comes as the 40 days as the Son of Man, what is he going to do? He's going to be doing absolutely incredible miracles. He's going to be even raising the dead in some instances. Not everybody, but some. He's going to be healing the sick, the blind. He's going to be doing all sorts of incredible miracles. And he's going to perform it to these great multitude. The Mark group. People from the Mark group representing the great multitude here. And listen to what it says. 
and from the Sea of Coast to Sidon, which came near to them, and to be healed of their diseases. Do you think everybody, when the Son of Man comes, he's not going to declare, I am the Christ, remember? He's coming as the Son of Man. And do you think everybody's going to think he's the Antichrist? No. Most of the church will. Most Arabs will. Muslims, I mean. They will. But will everybody in the church, will every Arab? No. There will be a representation of multitudes that will come to see him hearing of these incredible things that he's doing. Who do you think these people are going to be represented as? Probably a lot of the poor and the sick and the lame and so forth, right? People that are desperate. As it was when he came the first time. Desperate, but even more than desperate because there will be those that realize that they've missed what they think was the great multitude rapture. <clears throat> and look what happens. These people are coming to him and look at what it says. And to be healed of their diseases. Luke 6, 18. And they were vexed with unclean spirits and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. Isn't that interesting? What have we taught on when Christ comes? When Messiah comes as the Son of Man for 40 days, which the whole world thinks I'm a nut job for it, we have proven it. We know that he comes for 40 days. It is revealed in the revelation of the Gospels. He comes as the Son of Man that he did not fulfill as Jonah was. But the enemy has preempted this by telling his Muslims that this, Ma, the, this al Messi, the Dajjal coming, is actually the Christian Antichrist. And Christians are told that Christ won't come until the end. So if they believe they've missed now the great multitude rapture, which they did miss the pre, and they're left, they're all expecting Messiah's coming right away. Uh, uh, Antichrist is coming right away. And the Muslims have been told that this guy who comes first is coming for 40 days and is going to do so many miracles that it's going to be people thinking he's Jesus because he's going to be almost indistinguishable in the miracles he did like Jesus did when he was here. They've been deceived. And what do they call him? They call him deceitful Messiah, the Dajjal. You see, it's not mentioned in the Quran. It's mentioned in their other scriptures. Listen to what it says. Like in Christianity, the Dajjal is said to emerge out of the East, although not a specific location or various sources. The Dajjal will imitate the miracles performed by Jesus, such as healing the sick and raising the dead. And they say, oh, but the latter one can only come from devils. Oh, really? Devils can raise the dead? I think not. You see? So they've twisted it. It says, the jowl, uh, the root of meaning liar, deception is meant as deceiver, uh, compound, a jowl, article, deceiving Messiah, a specific end time deceiver. They call him the, the Christian Antichrist. And as you go on to read it, you read that he's here for 40 days. We've shared this a number of times in the past, right? Look at that. That he would stay 40 days. Do you not think the enemy is aware that the Son of Man is coming at the beginning for 40 days? Hello? <clears throat> this is the typology of him coming. And what is he doing? Healing the sick, healing the diseases, the wounded. He's raising people from the dead. Is he, the, is he going to be the Antichrist? Of course not. He is the Son of Man coming, just like was prophesied, but because the churches don't know the Gospels, in the revelation of the Gospels, and, and what these apparent contradictions, these differences within the Gospels were, they're not prepared. It was God's plan. It's his harvest model. 
listen to this and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples hello and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples don't we see that same term but the disciples doing that to christ don't we see that exact same term in luke chapter 21 which is during this 40 days and what does it say when they see the son of man coming this this son of man coming is not the pre-trib escape this is what's coming when the son of man comes after the wedding this is for the disciples to see not the pre-trib group it says and when they shall see the son of man coming this is the disciple group coming in a cloud with power and great glory and when these things begin to come to pass then look up this is the redemption of the disciple workers who were waiting for him when he returns from the wedding just as they looked up to him for his coming we see jesus lift up his eyes you know what else is interesting about that what about john chapter 8 right we know that this worker bride this remnant gentile bride you see only he could throw the stone at her when is the stone's throw coming it's coming during the week of the wedding in heaven it's coming during the week while the wedding is happening in heaven the stone's throw will be seen i believe about three days before he comes to start his 40 days only he could throw the stone at her and then what does it say as he was stooped down john 8 verse 7 and when they continued asking him he lifted up himself and said unto them see uh see that is he that is without sin let him cast the first stone at her nobody could cast a stone at her but him okay now listen to this and they all left uh okay let me go to john john 9 john 8 verse 9 and when they had heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one beginning at the eldest even unto the last and jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst you see only jesus is left and he's bent down like a proposal and looking up at her you see and it says and when jesus lifted up himself and saw none but the woman and what did he tell her here's the typology of this of this remnant worker bride neither do i condemn thee go and sin no more see he's now here starting his 40 days he's going to meet with her first right he's going to meet with the apostles right just briefly on that eighth day then he's going to meet with this disciple worker this gentile woman remnant bride who saw the stones throw coming as the world did and what happens luke 21 men's hearts failing them but this group is ready this group knows what's coming and then tells them sin no more and it's the start of the 40 days and look he is the light of the world shall not walk in darkness right but shall have light that's exactly the story of his 40 days beginning exactly without question absolutely it's the beginning of his 40 days we we've talked about it many times again going to isaiah 9. right the first attack in in northern israel and then he comes at the typology of his birth to shine the light to those that are in darkness okay Look what else we see. So it says uh, in Luke 6, verse 20, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Wow, there's a lot in that, right? First of all, we know it associates us, uh, this group, to 1 Peter, right? 
starting in chapter 1 verse 4 to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fades not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of god through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time which means in the end of days they are kept remember the hidden ones those in jeremiah chapter 4 right to the the connection to the end of the 40 and then the 50th day the attack but they were being warned compassed about by watchmen that was with the 40 days of the son of man and you can see it right here which this the last time means the end of days when it starts wherein you rejoice greatly though now for a season if need be you are in heaviness through many fold temptations right but what does he say when he shows up when jesus shows up and they no longer have need of faith which is coming in the next verse what does he tell them go and sin no more you see their place is secured they've now met face to face with the lord prior to it they were going through many fold temptations and heaviness like we are right like everybody in christ and then look what it says verse 7 that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold and of uh and of thing uh, uh, that perishes though it be tried with fire <clears throat> might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of christ jesus whom having not seen you love in whom though now you see him not yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls you see now they see him now they'll sin no more now they're being anointed by him in the understanding and what does it say verse 10 of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently you see searching what or what manner of time a period of time the spirit of christ which was in them did signify beforehand this is that same group you'll even see it in relation to the prophets speaking to the same connection to this group here what else did we have well we saw that group right theirs is the kingdom of heaven uh, uh, theirs is reserved in heaven the kingdom of god their place is reserved there it's for them what else did we see that ye were poor right we see that they were poor well let's go to revelation chapter 2 which one is the connection to poor the one with the apostles which is related to ephesus or the one to smyrna which is related to the seals workers of the luke 24 disciples you see i know thy works and thy tribulation and poverty poverty it's always about a poverty this group that is giving up everything right Oh, let me go sell this sell that well you know i gotta do this i gotta do that no you gotta be willing to give it all up when this comes and i believe this is what i'm helping prepare everybody for do i think everybody is a worker in this ministry no i believe many are and many are being rewarded with diligently seeking that we're crying out to the lord saying lord i'm just not understanding what is why does this say this and that says that I'm, I'm confused with trying to follow this. And you've been brought to the ministry to help understand those things. You see, it's the disciples. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples. Just like he says, and go and sin no more. You that are poor, Smyrna, <laughs> yours is the kingdom of God. It's reserved for you. It's all about these seals workers. Listen to this. Luke 6, 23. Rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy, for behold. You see, who are the ones leaping for joy and excitement? 
those that were in Christ diligently seek him. The same as 1 Peter 1. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. Your reward is great in heaven. Do you remember who else is connected to reward? Enoch, right? Those who... Uh, uh, those who believe that he is who he says he is, that God is God, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The pre-trib group are all those being rewarded for diligently seeking him. But there's great reward for those who will be his servants. He chooses them. He chooses them. I believe I'm helping prepare and that a number of us are. But I'm not the chooser. I'm the sharer. I'm, 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 I'm bringing about his revelation for the years to come in the entirety of his word to the greatest of my understanding and ability. Nothing of the revelation has changed. It's always been about when it begins. But the revelation of when it begins, everything we've understood is there. And when he anoints the group with the understanding, when he comes at those 40 days to these disciples, they will have the full understanding. And as 1 John 1 tells, they will no longer need to be taught by anybody. That's why I'm saying I'm preparing. I don't know all things, but I am preparing the remnant worker bride of which I may most likely be a part of. And when he comes, he will make the rest of it completely understood. Your reward is great in heaven. Now listen to this. Remember I said the, the even the, the, the prophet's connection is here? For in like manner, did their fathers unto the prophets. Remember the connection in 1 Peter 1? The prophets who diligently sought as well, just like this group. Same thing. Same thing. <clears throat> Listen to this. Uh, is it verse 30? Luke 6, verse 30. Give to every man that he asks. Oh, imagine this one, right? Give to every man that he asks of thee. And of him that takes away thy goods, ask them not again. Wow. Somebody steals it from you, let him have it. Somebody asks of you, let it be. Right? Provide it. Wow. And as you would that men should do unto you, do ye unto them also. This is going to be a serious time, right? But the Lord will provide it all. The Lord will provide it all. Do you know what kind of a fear of death you're going to have during seals if you're a seals worker, anointed by the Lord with the understanding and then receiving the anointing of the Holy Ghost? Do you know what kind of fear you're going to have of death? <laughs> none. Absolutely none. Why? Because your faith is no more. You will have been in the presence of your faith. Anointed then by the literal Holy Ghost. After having been in the presence of your faith. Why do you think it was, it was Paul just was able to do what he did? Because there was faith no more. You see, Paul's faith was really part of these other groups as well at that time where their faith was no more because they were in the presence of it. They knew it. And they received the anointing of the Holy Ghost. The literal physical anointing within them of the Holy Ghost. There was no fear. Many of us don't have fear. But I think maybe, you know, being captured, you know, hiding out and knowing that you're being brought to a guillotine. Somebody's going to take out maybe a sword and slice your head off. <laughs> if you were literally in that position now, eh, you might be a little concerned, right? 
But in this type of worker anointing that's coming and understanding, that fear won't be there. That understanding of knowing not a hair of your head will be touched, that fear won't be there. You will be like, ah, Lord, into your arms. Father, into your arms, I commend my spirit. It's beautiful. Watch this. As we come close to finishing here, we're almost done. Luke 6, verse 35. But love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. Listen to this. And ye shall be the children of the highest. Hello. Who are the children of the highest? The co-heirs with Christ. You see, even though these things were things that happened in the is, and there's a way to, in the is, live it out in daily life, there is a much more direct context in an is-to-come application of it. Even though there is the is, and living it out this way in our lives as we should, but in the is to come, it is so clear with end time eyes. It's amazing. Let's go to verse 39 and 40. 39, 40, and then we're just about done. And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? Hello. Hello. Do you see what's happening here? You'll see it. You'll see it clearly in the next verse. The, the disciples have to be given understanding. They must be like 1 John. I think it's in 1 John. Let me see real quick. I'm going to show it to you so you can clearly see it. You see this group? If you go read it yourself, you're going to see, look, we the beginning. Oh, it's the beginning again. Do you think that's by chance? Do you think this is by chance? It's the same definition for the same word, the beginning. See, which we have heard, which we have seen, our eyes have been with them, we handled them. It was the life made manifest to us. You see, this is the same group of disciple workers. They met them. And then what happens? It ends up going to tell them that they will no longer need to be taught. Um, 1 John 2, verse 20. But you have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. See that? And you know all things. Right here, verse 27. But the anointing which you have received of him abides in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things, who knows all things? Luke's group, the disciples, and in truth, of all things, and in truth, and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. This is the same group. Any of you out there never have to be taught anything of the, of the word of the Lord? Do you know all things? Not a single one of us does. This was in the is speaking to a group of people at that time. And we take typologies in daily life to apply them. But has any of you or can any of us anywhere on earth just already know all things and nobody needs to teach us? Absolutely not. Which means if everything that was is to come and is is to come, this is also prophetic for a group that will be represented as them in the is to come, which is related to Luke and the disciples. Nobody will need to teach this group because they will be the ones who have been given the understanding of all things and their understanding open and been anointed by the Holy Ghost. You see? It's the same group. This is this conversation and this context being talked about in the is to come. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? How can a group in the coming end of days lead another group if they haven't been given the understanding of all things? 
they'll both fall into the ditch. You see, the disciple, the seals workers, the Luke group, the Smyrna, Luke 24 group, is not above his master. You see, why would it say that the disciple is not above his master? <coughs> because he's been anointed by his master in the understanding. You see, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. How powerful is that? Any one of you as his master? Perfect as his master? Heck no. It's an end time application. There is a was when it was literal, and then there's daily life over the last couple thousand years, and we try to be, but there's going to be a physical, actual again in the years to come. It's the disciples. They're obviously not above their master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. How wild is that? The understanding given, nobody needs to teach them, anointed by the Holy Ghost, and will do the things that he has done, raise them from the dead, heal the sick, heal the blind, sight to the blind. It is going to be a wild, beyond comprehension experience as workers during the 40 days with the Lord and the time of seals to come. It is going to be nothing we can comprehend in the midst of the greatest chaos in human history. Wild, man. Listen, to, listen how this comes to an end. For a good tree brings forth, you see? For a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit. Neither does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every fruit, every tree is known by its own, by his own fruit. You see, there it is again. Remember Polycarp's name means much fruit. The seals workers, 14ers, 14ers are going to produce good fruit. It's awesome. Listen to this. As we bring it right to a close, we're almost at the end of the chapter. Remember foundation connections? You see? Just so happens there's foundation connections in this as well. Uh, 648. He is like a man which builds a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, stream, the stream beat vehemently upon the house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. When is the foundation being laid, brothers and sisters? Seals. Who is responsible in the, in the spiritual sense during the time of seals? The apostles. Remember, go read Revelation 21. The apostles are the foundation. The 144,000 represent the walls. The 12 tribes are the doors. But the seals workers are the ones that are there with them that will be part of the resurrection to rule and reign with them during the millennial reign. And they'll have been established on the foundation of the rock. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's literally what we teach knowing that the foundation is laid during the time of seals by Zerubbabel as the overseer during the time of seals. There's a physical foundation while a spiritual one is being laid. You see, the physical one <coughs> is being laid by Zerubbabel, the, the overseer of the responsibility of the foundation of the temple during seals. And the apostles who had the, 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 the full anointing from the Son and the Holy Ghost from the beginning. Look at what it says. Uh, the 12 gates, 12 walls. The 12 foundations had the names of the 12 apostles of the lambs. The walls, the 144, okay? As the typology, the 144,000. While the temple walls of the temple is being built, 
during the time of trumpets and the 144,000 are sent out. And, of course, the 12 gates represent the 12 tribes during the millennial reign that go out during the millennial reign through which the, the, through which the people on the earth will come to the Lord during the millennial reign at the appointed feasts, of course, as tabernacles that all the kings of the earth, all the leaders will be going to the Lord through the 12 gates, which represent the tribes during the millennial reign. Brothers and sisters, I have never spent that kind of time in Luke chapter 6 before in my life. We have spent so many times in so many chapters of Luke. And it started because I was simply going to look at a, at a chapter to year maybe thing going on in Luke. I, I was going to, to put together Luke, Mark, and Matthew and all of these different things that we've shown in the end time typology of it. And as I went into Luke 6 saying, oh, you know, I haven't really spent much time in Luke 6. I said, oh, my goodness. It is a smorgasbord. <laughs> I don't know why that came to me. It was a smorgasbord of just, oh my goodness, how fitting and how appropriate that this was revealed for us now. You know why? Because we've been building on so many things connected to the SEALs worker group. It's, it's unimaginable. The amount of things, it, it's, it's incredible. The amount of things that we have brought forward in connection to this Smyrna disciple group of workers. They are Smyrna. They are Romans 16, Priscilla and Aquila putting their necks on the line. They are the John the Baptist type seals workers. They are the Luke 24. It's everywhere. And we know that they are the ones throughout Luke represented as those when he returns from the wedding who he will sup with and dine and open their understanding for them to go about and do his work as what? Where is it? As disciples being made perfect shall be as their master not above him below him but as him doing his will and his work through them who he says go and sin no more whose faith will be no more because they will have been in the presence of it who will no longer need anyone to teach them because they will be spread out throughout the earth bringing in the great multitude for the end of seals brothers and sisters i pray this has blessed you i pray that it strengthens you that we have the the vigor and the energy and the and the drive and and the willingness to continue to pray for each other to lift each other up to 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 do all of these things needed to support each other to intercede for each other until that day comes our time the beginning brothers and sisters in one way or another is taurus i pray that we will continue to strengthen each other lift each other up because i will continue to do my part i hope and pray we will all continue to do our part as the lord leads us in his will in him for that time that is at hand even though it may not be tomorrow. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. Talk to you soon. Bye for now.